Join me every month for the inspiration to find your finish line. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Find Your Finish Line. I'm Mike Riley, your host, and this podcast is not only about you being able to find your finish line at a race or an event, but also in life. I'll talk to people who have overcome all kinds of odds against them to get to where they are today and to find that finish line. And my guest today is reaching for the highest finish line in the world. He's 43 years old. He's a record-breaking mountaineer and adventurer from Nepal and South Asia. But he's a double above-the-knee amputee. He lost his legs in an IED explosion in 2010 in Afghanistan while he served for the British Army as a Gurkha, and we'll talk about that. But his goal is to climb Mount Everest, to attempt that this year over 8,800 meters, everybody, 29,000 feet. Hari Buddha Magar, welcome to Find Your Finish Line. Uh, Hello, Mike, and hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, It's a great honor to be on your podcast. Well, I I appreciate that, and it's an honor for me to to meet you and, and have you on. I always ask my guests right up front, Hari, what kind of workout did you get in today? Um, I just um, uh, I've been a little bit of exercise, and which is I do day to day, two hours uh, in the gym, just uh, maintain my fitness uh, and just uh, build some of the uh, uh, some of my bodies and the strength and conditioning that I need to do. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm just busy on. Lots of um, you know interviews and uh, calls uh, for to just to get ready and raise some funds. Uh, talking with my sponsors uh, for um, uh, for for going uh, going to happen in this spring. Oh, I know. I, I I can't wait to follow it. We'll we'll find out how we do that too before the end of the show. So Hari, your your upbringing. You, you were born. In a cow shed, which is just is amazing to me. You, you went through an arranged marriage when you were 11 years old. You had an upbringing that was uh, challenging, to say the least. How do you think those challenges in your young life have prepared you for your life today? Uh, I, I feel that um, I was, uh, you know, privileged to go through uh, those things. At that time, it wasn't nice. Uh, at the time, I didn't want it to be in that situation. Uh, but I think uh, that actually made me the person that who I am right now. Um, so uh, you know, if say you know, you know, I if you say would I change? I think I wouldn't change. I think, uh, and that's what I think this actually makes me. Um, so. Can you can you go through with us that day? You joined uh, the Royal Gurkha Rifles uh, at 19 years old, and everyone, if you don't know what the Gurkhas are, they are a well-established military unit that is looked on upon from all over the world as one of the best in the world, and you joined that at 19 years old, but then in 2010, serving for the British Army in Afghanistan, you lost both your legs. Can you take us through that day? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so it was the uh, 17th uh, April 2010. Um, uh, it was uh, in Naris district in Helman province. Uh, we just got in, um, and on that day, uh, our mission was there. We had two missions. Uh, one was to go, uh, uh, you know, take two engineers so that they can uh, recce the well. So world, it was like a old damaged well, so that they can go back and repair the well so uh, local people can have a water. Uh, second one, we were just got into that area. So uh, our job was to familiarize uh, with that area. Uh, so... It was about three, four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, uh, we just, you know, we had an order. Uh, we rehearsed, rehearsed it, um, and just, uh, yeah, we are 
20 in the squad um, uh, and I was 10th uh, in single file. Uh, we just walked out the compound. Uh, we passed a couple of compounds, a couple of poppy fields, a couple of irrigation ditches. Uh, and we're just walking um, uh, in a very narrow path. Um, but, uh, and um, you know, suddenly it went bang and just, uh, my life changed forever. And not only serving as a sniper as you have with uh, serving 15 years over five continents and covert surveillance, you were also a medic. So when that explosion happened and you, you were assessing what was going on with you, you probably knew a little bit more about it than others, didn't you? Your injuries. Yeah, the, the first thing um, uh, I noticed was it was ringing my <laughs> right ear uh, and I had a radio on the left um, uh, and when bomb, you know, lifted me up, it just pressed me at the back. Mm. Um, so uh, my body armor covered my face. So just yeah, uh, I also I also injured my right arm as well. So couldn't able to move. Uh, I had um, uh, my Tony kits and my personal first aid kit on the right uh, right hand side. So I was just trying to um, take it out. Uh, so um, I couldn't because it was just like a too too big for 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 to reach that side. So. Uh, later, my friend came uh, and passed me up. Um, I, and uh, uh, yeah, at the time, um, I, we trained before, you know, we trained mm -hmm. about six months before we head to the operation. So uh, we know, you know, what to do with the garden concert wound, what to do with the amputations. Uh, what about the, the first guys at the front that got injured? What what happens at the back? If someone get injured, what about someone in the middle is injured? What about if someone shoots at you? Uh, what about it's just like we kind of uh, you know train and practice for all the eventuality and how to um, uh, extract casualty. So um, yeah, for me, I knew exactly what what really happened, what I was going to. One point, I realized that. It, you know, uh, uh, on exercise, we train, like, say, okay, the, the instructor comes and tells you, okay, you lost your legs. Just pretend that, you know. You, you know, that's wow. what I kind of think, oh, did it really happen? And no, it was real. Um, so, yeah, my my colleagues, they did a great job and uh, called the heli and, uh, you know, sent, um, sent back me to the Camp Basin, which is a field hospital. But... A uh, great thing is I was uh, rescued by your guys, um, the consign called Pedro. Mm. So uh, two of the heli came and rescued me in 17 minutes. Can you imagine that? Wow. So quick. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, I, I, you, you know, my life was saved by the Tony Quit, uh, the cat that, uh, you know, uh, designed by... Uh, uh, the guys uh, in America, you know, so, so yeah, pretty much, you know, I think without, without you guys, possibly I wouldn't survive uh, and maybe talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. And, uh, the concerted effort, it, it sounds like, you know, they got you to hospital quickly, all the preparation, Hari, but it's very tough to prepare for afterwards. Uh, you know, I read about how your wife and, came to the hospital and it stopped her in her tracks when she saw you. Uh, you, you had embarrassment obviously because you now felt you couldn't, you know, support your family in the way you, you wanted to support them. You turned to alcohol and, and the medications take us through that time of mentally trying to get through probably the toughest part of the recovery. Uh Yes, it was really, really tough. A um, uh, couple of reasons, I think. Uh, one thing was uh, I grew up up to age of uh, nineteen in Nepal, so I grew up in that culture, mm -hmm. and I was I wasn't that aware about disability, what could be done, what can be done. Those are the things that um, uh, I knew there. But also another one was 
I also saw that how badly the disabled people, were, you know, were treated uh, as well. Um, and I thought, you know, my life is finished. Um, as a kind, uh, you know, many people in Nepal think that, you know, this is scene of previous life, or uh, you know, after I'm lost my legs, I'm I couldn't able to do anything, and I'm the burden of the earth. Just I'm just, you know, this is what I I thought. Uh, and I couldn't mm, come out uh, from that quite a while. Uh, and I just used um, um, uh, alcohol and, uh, you know, drugs, uh, which is medicine prescribed by my doctors, uh, to just control my pain and emotions. Um, but also, um, you know, in, in, in Nepal, in our culture, um, I was the first son in my in the family. We had three brothers. Uh, we had five siblings. Uh, and uh, my mom and dad, they didn't have any pension. Uh, we, you know, I grew up in a very, very remote village um, in Nepal. So uh, my we just moved to the Kathmandu, which is capital city. And my brothers, uh, you know, were going to uh, college. Uh, and I was the one who's funding everything to my family. Uh, and um, here in the UK, as well, I have got a daughter and son and my wife. And we just moved from Brunei. Our regiment was just moved from Brunei to UK. So my wife wasn't working at that time. I had got a little boy. She was looking after it. So what's going to happen, you know? Uh, I was the breadwinner in the family. So, you know, how long, you know, am I going to get still the job? Am I going to get get out, you know? So there's so much uncertainty about that. Um, and uh, I was just, at one point I was just drinking so much and so I couldn't able to... Um, you know, stand still, just city straight. I was just kind of very fiddly. Uh, my brains get foggy. Um, I couldn't remember the things that would have, uh, mm. what I have done. Uh, my hands were very shaky when I didn't drink. Um, and I thought, yeah, uh, you know, if I'm going that way, then, you know, my life is was going to, uh, you know, be in quite soon. So yeah, um, I was going through that and if I, let's say, die, it's my, it's end of my story, but but my family will suffer because of me, uh, you know. Uh, so I just didn't know what I was going to do, but, you know, yeah, I, I can't die just for my family. So I'm gonna, I just decided one day that I'm going to survive. I uh, didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and uh, uh, there is non-profit. Uh, it's a charity that offering injured soldiers for skydiving and some other uh, adaptive events, uh, adaptive sports. Uh, and uh, even I was in the army, I never done the skydiving. So, you know, I always uh, wanted to experience that. But secondly, I was half suicidal, but I just look at and in 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 the UK houses are really small, especially depends on of what you know age of the house is. And uh, normally, the modern houses are very uh, you know very low ceiling, uh, very small rooms. Uh, and uh, I I used to look at the breezes, the whether I can jump up, but it's very hard that from wheelchair you can climb that wall and <laughs> jump out. Uh, and um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. And uh, you know, if, if if I die, half of my body's gone. If another half goes, that's fine. <laughs> you know, that's oh, how. Wow, it, it's a it it is amazing, Harry, how people at the what they think is the end of their life really is the beginning of their life, and the life that you turned around and and yeah, the perceptions in Nepal, you've got. Over four and a half million people with disabilities, and everybody looked down on that. So you were fighting that cultural battle of of what the country was all about. But then you started changing perceptions uh, because you, you you decided to start climbing. 
start climbing and you started climbing the highest peaks in the world. You had small prosthetics made to do that. What got you into the sport of climbing? Uh, so initially, uh, after my skydiving, uh, you know, when I landed safely on uh, in the ground, uh, I kind of like, mm, yeah, you can do the things even if you don't have legs. You know, uh, I yeah. kind of had really little, little confidence. And after that, my aim was to what can I do physically? I didn't know how powerful is the mind. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, what can I do physically after losing my both legs, you know? And then after I started all kind of, you know, sports and events, anything that I can put my hands on, I could get involved. I tried everything, P pretty much all the Paralympic sports uh, that I got involved. Uh, I skied in Alps, um, I kayaked. I actually kayaked from in the Yukon River in Canada, 465 miles for two weeks. Mm. I kayak around Isle of Wight, uh, which is first amputees to kayak around um, um, island. Uh, I kayaked um, you know, the Second World War. There is a movie called uh, Cockshell Heroes, which is a uh, British Royal Marine Commandos who you know, kayaked and do put a, you know, explosive on German ships in France. So in river border. So so I did uh, 94 miles, uh, five days. Um, I kayaked around. Um, I skied in uh, Colorado. I came twice. Um, I would love to come back again. <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 I did biathlon and some skiing in Whistler uh, in Canada with... Uh, I think 2010 Winter Olympic was held. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I did indoor climbing. Uh, I came to Endeavor Games in Oklahoma uh, and won a uh, gold medal in archery and uh, bronze medal in uh, table, uh, wheelchair table tennis. Um, I came to San Diego as a, a Paralympic military program. Uh, program. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, I did quite lots of uh, cycling um, for non-profits in the USA as well. Uh, last June, actually, I came um, to cycle with the Wounded Warriors oh, okay. uh, in New York for a couple of days. Uh, so, um, so I was doing kind of all, um, all the things that, you know, what can I do uh, physically? And that is the time that uh, when I was skiing, I looked at the snow-capped mountains and I just thought about, yeah, uh, because in Nepal, uh, from little A's, uh, you know, right. in our textbooks, uh, we, we, uh, I read about, uh, you, know, you know, Mount Everest is the tallest peak in the world. It's in Nepal and we Nepalese people are very proud of that. Uh, and um, uh, just what about, you know, it just really fascinated me that what about me doing it. And I, in Nepal, uh, I grew up looking in looking to the mountains every day. Uh, so, um, um, so, so, so this is what I was going in my mind. And uh, actually, I tried when I was in service as well, uh, but just I couldn't able to um, it take just two months just for you know, climbing itself uh, on the Everest. So um, I was more uh, focused on training operations and, uh, you know, my career. So I couldn't able to do that. Uh, then after my injury, this is what was going in my mind. And uh, there is one guy I met in one social event who is a is, um, uh, former uh uh, mountain troop leader in SAS and chief mountain instructor and um, uh, instructor who actually led uh, Gorkha expedition uh, 2015 and 17. Uh, he climbed a couple of uh, big mountains, K2, Daulagiri, Manasalu, and uh, uh, and he led that expedition. And he said, "What do I, he, he 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 skied from Daulagiri and um, from the summit after summiting Daulagiri, he skied down." Jeez. So um, I was 
just talking to him and say, this is what I'm thinking. Um, uh, he just asked me to propose me to be skiing in Nepal <laughs> first. Uh, then, uh, then, yeah, if when we're going there, can we able to do the other things as well, you know? Um, you know, I want to climb mountains, so you are a mountaineer, so can you help me to, um, to, to, to climb mountains? Can I, can I test myself? And uh, uh, the thing is, I wanted to um, uh, test myself how my body feels on altitude and whether it's physically possible. So, yeah, we went to Nepal. Uh, we went up to uh, 4,300 meters uh, and, you know, practice Hillary steps, practice walking in the ice, uh, practice, you know, crossing the ladders. Um, and after that, yeah, it was possible. So I committed myself to climbing a mountain, but it wasn't it's a lot. There was a lot, a lot, a lot um, challenges uh, uh, that uh, I had to face. Yeah, you and and at that time when you went up with him, did you have your short prosthetics then? Did were they were they made for you by then? It wasn't made. So uh, the prosthetic was so here in my um, uh, uh, rehabilitation center where I went and uh, mm -hmm. I asked, "Do you have got any uh, you know legs, uh, prosthetic legs that I could able to uh, climb the mountain? I can use them in ice and snow." And so they says. Uh, they said no. So um, I have got some ideas. Would you able to maybe weld it up or put the screws in and, and I can able to do that? And I said no. Uh, they said also no. Because in, in the UK, um, uh, you know, health and safety is very, very tight. It's not like in the US. Yeah, in the US you can do, I, I don't know what is the rules and regulations, but... <laughs> But, but you, know, you know, I get help lots from uh, there. So uh, those percent, uh, you know, once said that that's fine, I'll find somewhere. Hopefully, I'll find someone who will be interested to maybe adapt some of my legs and push it. I would be able to do that. And at that time, I found um, a, a, a friend uh, in Colorado. He he is one above knee amputee. He was. Uh, he welded some of the crampons himself and climbing in, uh, uh, yeah, in, in on ice. So, some ways I reached out, uh, uh, my friends reached out to him and I also reached out and uh, he sent me a pair, pair, a pair, pair of it. And this is I took the, to test myself on there. That after that, on that the principle, um, you know, we we designed some of and improved slightly. Still, a lot uh, needs to improve, but I think um, um, uh, I can still be able to climb. And that's also one company in Orlando who adopted that. Uh, at the moment, there's one uh, one company in New York who is doing that. At the moment, he actually uh, all, uh, bought my sockets and my grandpa's and in the U.S., they are kind of adapting at the moment. Well, and then, uh, Hari, you get your equipment taken care of and you start climbing. You become the first double amputee to summit a mountain higher than 6,000 meters. And, and uh, But the comments you made was you're doing this to honor your country. Why do, why do you think you're climbing? And then we'll get into the Everest and you battling the Supreme Court. <laughs> of Nepal. But why do you think your climbing is an honor to your country? Uh, I think some ways, uh, I grew up to the age of 19 um, um, in Nepal. Uh, at the moment, it's, I live in UK. This is another country that uh, was my country, but it's my motherland. It's my motherland. It always will be. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to forget, and I shouldn't forget that as well. So uh, I grew up to up the age of 19, came to the United Kingdom um, and uh, served all over the world. Um, and for uh, 15 years, uh, I lost both my legs as a part of my service. Uh, but some of the ways, looking back to Nepal, my motherland, you know, what actually I have given. 
Um, and I have seen the problems that how the disabled people were, uh, you know, are treated in Nepal. Um, and this is, I think, for me, just climbing a mountain that I can make more awareness um, about the disability uh, in Nepal uh, and around the world. Not just Nepal, but many countries around the world. Um, you know, the perception that I said earlier, if that that has it. So, um, so for me, is doing that is just some ways I'm giving back uh, mm -hmm. to 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 my country. So this is why I say it's my honor, and I have dedicated my life, um, the rest of my life, at least some time I will give uh, to Nepal and around the world to make more, more awareness of a disability. So that, you know, um, if we talk about, uh, you know, population of disability, uh, WHO is meet, uh, est estimates that um, about 12 to 15 percent of the, you know, uh, populations, uh, are, um, you know, ha ha have some kind of disability. So if we put that in context, it's about a billion of us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think... Um, I know that every, but every day people are getting disabled, uh, whether they are um, at, on walk or they are driving, or working in the street or just doing their day-to-day, -day, the, something that climbing a mountain or doing things, whatever they're doing day-to-day, -day, what they love to do. Uh, people every day getting uh, disabled. Uh, but for some people are, uh, as a, you, you, know, you know, born uh, that the way. Uh, so I think any problem we can't uh, hide, um, hide it. it. It just becomes a bigger problem. So, just talking about just Nepal, which is let's say even ten percent, it's about three million disabled people. If we can just bring them and support them, so they can work, uh, pay the tax, uh, and you know that would be huge. Uh, to in development of uh, country uh, and in same ways um, around the world. Uh, so simply for me is is to I think um, whatever happens, we can still live in full as long as our mind works. Uh, some of people who can't make a decision themselves make sure they can able to live uh, with the respect and the dignity and uh, you know that's the, the thing. But also. For people with disability, we can still live our life in full. But also, there's many um, uh, countries, that, uh, you know, even some of like authorities, they are very educated academically, but I think not educated in sense of disability, and and uh, you know they 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 are not supporting the disabled people um, as they should be. Uh, so that's one of the things that you know my, uh, you know, bearing disabled peoples from climbing a mountain, you know. They are very educated, but they are not aware. That's why they put a ban on me uh, and the visually impaired. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think this is very important. And I dedicated my uh, rest of life at some of, uh, some of my time that I will, did, you know, you know uh, do that to making awareness of disability. And climbing mountain is one, one of one of it, <laughs> and and that's a huge one because changing perceptions anywhere in the world is a very difficult thing to do. In your culture, it may even be a little more difficult. But I can imagine you're seeing some some change. But then you had to go here in 2017. You did that great climb, but I believe that was the same year that the Supreme Court in Nepal banned. Solo climbers up Everest, blind climbers, and double amputee climbers up Everest. So you go to battle <laughs> against the Supreme Court of Nepal. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, I was you know another training at the at the moment. It was in December. Um, another training, um, doing just my winter training, so that I can able to climb Everest in 2018. That's mm -hmm. what my target, and I was just working on that. And when I was on the mountain, suddenly um, a Nepal government put a ban on us. And so, you know, I, I think 
you can't just ban the people even they can't climb. <laughs> um, I think it. Why do you, well, we Harry? Why do you? Why do you, I'm sorry? Why do you? Why do you think they all of a sudden just put a ban on, on that? I think there was a lots of pressure um, on Nepal government uh, because lots of people were dying. Lots of people were very unprepared. Some of some of people go to the base camp uh, and uh, they don't even don't know how to put the crampons on. So it was lots of pressure to the government. That, uh, they, this is why they go up and they got in trouble because they don't have enough experience. And um, and when uh, the companies once they get the money, you, you know it's about right. money for them. So right. you know they just take them up the mountain. Uh, so there was lots of pressure, and I think the easiest they could do is to put a ban on that. People with disabilities, so that they, had, you know, you know, they can release their pressure, but it wasn't the case. They got more pressure uh, from outside. So, so then, uh, but it took a few years because it was overturned. What in 2020? So you were on the mountain in 2018. You find out about the ban, but two years later, uh, it it happened. Did you actually go in front of the Supreme Court? Yes, we did. Um, I personally didn't, uh, but uh, because I was living in London, I personally just going to court, uh, just uh, uh, doing day-to-day the things is uh, hard. So my friends in Nepal, they went to Supreme Court. Uh, I supported them uh, pretty much all the legwork that uh, I did, I did. Um, I um, supported financially, I campaigned, I met many politicians, and uh, I, I had a great help from the ambassador of the United Kingdom and, uh, um, and you know, American ambassador to Nepal, um, also some Nepalese ambassador to, the, you know, to, to abroad as well. Uh, so, um, and many... Uh, civil organizations that who joined me to campaign this. Uh, and um, uh, wa- one day I gave, I think, 17 or 18 interviews. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, to, to and when you kind of, you know, if you see the, all the articles, things that, that, you know, everybody says that is, 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 we're writing uh, and saying that, you know, I overturned the rule. Technically, I didn't. It's so my my friend who filed the case, and I supported the pact and the campaign. So, yeah, we were able to do 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 that. Um, finally, five judges unanimously decided that uh, yeah, this was unfair. Uh, you couldn't able to do that and overturn the rule. And after that, uh, the one Chinese climber uh, went and. Uh, you, you know, climbed the double amputee, uh, who is, who is Bill Biloni, Jia Bao, uh, went and climbed a, you know, mountain, uh, and he achieved his dream. Uh, he, uh, this is, I think that was his first try. So, um, I think later, a couple of amputees went to Nepal and climbed mountains. So, it was actually bigger uh, mountain than climbing Everest. Yeah. But, <laughs> Uh, with help of everyone, we were able to, uh, you, you, you know, summit that mountain, I would say. Hold on, everyone. We'll be right back after a message from our sponsors. Curad, the official medical supplier of Iron Man. Let Curad keep you strong so those strains and pains of training and you trying to find your finish line go away. With their wraps, races, and tape, and especially their far-infrared kinesiology tape that'll keep you strong through all your training. Check out their products today on Amazon.com, at Walmart, and Ironman.com, and let Curad help you find your finish line. We're speaking with Hari Budamagar, double amputee above the knee, who is going to climb Mount Everest here in the spring. And let's talk about Hari, let's talk about your route, the route you've chosen. Uh, you are going to go up the, the, the South Call uh, from Nepal. 
there's less snow on that route, I understand, because of the hot, but then you have the high winds. That's why there's less snow. And then you're going to go up to the Kumba Falls, the Ice Falls. Why would you choose a route like that? Um, I think I'm from Nepal. So for me, I think uh, for me, it's slightly easier way, I think, if I go you know, from Tibet. But uh, you know, I you know I was born in Nepal, so I think I should uh, climb from you know, Nepal. <laughs> my country. I think <laughs> so. So that's kind of my logic. So, um, but also uh, about the rescuing, as also much easier from the southern side as well if something happens. And then uh, talk about your your support crew, your team. Uh, so in team, uh, uh, I'm climbing mountain, and he's he, he has led pretty much all the mountains that I have climbed so far. Uh, so is a uh, Chris Thapa, Chris not Thapa. Chris, yeah. Uh, he is the, uh, the, the former SS guy that, that uh, uh, which is I already mentioned, and he he's in Nepal at the moment sorting out. The, all the Sherpas, logistics, uh, and a bit. Uh, and we will be taking eight the Sherpas, um, who will be directly working on me, um, next to me, uh, and helping me out. Uh, other four will be carrying oxygen up and down, setting up the camps, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, taking the oxygen up, uh, taking the food up. Uh, but also, uh, if something happens, uh, then um, in army we call QR quick reaction force, so they come and uh, help us out if uh, we need it. Uh, so that's the, that's the team. And you, you is this the same crew that you've already uh, taken up to Everest Base Camp because you you did reach the base camp at at eighty eight hundred meters? Uh, you know, testing yourself. Is this the same crew? Uh, the best camp I went, some of them, but uh, I need more team, so I need to add more team. Um, uh, more, more, more team. As a higher I go, I need uh, the more people to to carry logistics and need need more help. Uh, need to carry my kids um, as well. So yes, I I trek to Everest Best Camp last spring uh, with my uh, GNMX trees, which is a prosthetic leg. Um, and I was the first double above knee amputee to trek with these legs to Everest Rest Camp, which took uh, nine days. And um, yeah, mm. it was great fun. It wasn't easy, but what is easy in life? Nothing is easy in life. <laughs> yeah, I love it when you say it's great fun going up, you know, 29,000 feet. <laughs> that is fantastic. So did you, that was a good test for you, wasn't it? Um, it was, uh, you know, I think okay. This I think it's part of, it was more about working. So my aim was to, um, uh, my aim was to, um, you know, trek with these legs to, mm -hmm. to to the Everest Base Camp, but also just know the route. Uh, that make sure I have done once, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, the other ones were hard. Um, so like a Mont Blanc was hard because we we're just too long in the field on the summit day. Uh, even the Ben Nevis here it was very hard uh, because I was doing with these legs to 23 hours, uh, 20 minutes. Um, and uh, I was just so tired. It was the rainy, windy, cold. Mm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my, Mont Blanc took uh, 23 hours. Um, so we ran out of water and just we, we were eating the snow uh, when we were coming down. So... And um, yeah, uh, but but I think the uh, most important thing is when we are prepared uh, mentally, uh, our body follows it, I think. <laughs> yeah. So we will get up there, whether crawling, rolling, uh, running, working, whatever ways that I, will, uh, I think we will get there. Well, Hari, uh, it usually takes what able-bodied people to 
you know, finally head up those Hillary steps to the top of Mount Everest usually takes about 18 hours or so. Uh, for able-bodied, how long do you think your journey is going to be? Uh, hopefully it will take a similar time, uh, but uh, I, I, I'm planning to put one more camp um, 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 uh, between uh, Camp Four and Summit, uh, so uh, so so that we can avoid the traffic, uh, traffic, uh, and because I'm slow, so I don't want to try not to delay the people while they, while they are going to the summit. Uh, so uh, we'll be climbing mostly at night, um, mm. uh, uh, and uh, when looking at back the history. Uh, uh, Tenzing and Hillary, they have put 10 camps. So I'll be putting maximum six camps if needed, uh, but uh, hopefully we can able to manage with uh, five camps. Wow. Uh, it's just to, to be a part of that <clears throat> and to follow the history, the footsteps of history has to be absolutely thrilling for you. Yeah, it, and, 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 you know... And, and this, is, this is all good. So th this is really coincidence that next year is 70th anniversary of the uh, uh, you know first summit of the Everest mm -hmm. and uh, 100 years of the, um, uh, the, the, the the first fly past was done uh, to take a picture of that uh, and um, uh, yeah and also here in the UK is next year is a coronation of the king as well. Mm -hmm. uh, which is the, the uh, actually the summit was done um, uh, the Hil Hillary and Tenzing summited when Queen Elizabeth II, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, under on, on that day it oh, was a coronation. Uh, coronation. So 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 um, it wasn't planned any, anything like this way. Uh, maybe if they didn't ban me, uh, I, I, I have already climbed in 2018 but you know it's just coincidence that everything is uh, you know <laughs> you know falling into place and and this adventure not adventure i should say this this uh goal of yours takes a lot of money and you have a crown crowdfunding page that uh that you're raising funds for can you tell us about that uh, yes, total, I need uh, 312,000 uh, pounds. Uh, I'm not sure how much in dollar, maybe around 350 or 400,000 dollars, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and um, mm, we are just over uh, halfway, um, I think. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is a it is a it is a bigger mountain to climb it uh, than the, uh, uh, Mount Everest again. Uh, you know, um, it's my background. I you know I was born in the cow shed, went barefoot to school. Uh, you know, never seen that amount of the money. I haven't I haven't seen that amount even now. <laughs> so uh, so my friends are uh, helping me out uh, and. Um, I, I have got um, quite a few uh, companies that who are helping me. One is North American Rescue, um, uh, who is actually the tourniquet that I used to stop the bleeding and uh, they saved my life, you know. So, so uh, they're really help, helping. So uh, uh, higher peak that, you know, they're sending me oxygen. Um, you know, uh, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a bed. That I can sleep in on seven thousand meter if if I want it. <laughs> so so to, to it would make help me to climatize uh, 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 sleeping in that bed. So I I just called earlier to re-deliver because I was uh, in Nepal last week, so couldn't able to deliver here. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, but it's still a long way to go. Uh, I'm pretty much sure that we'll get there. Uh, we're talking to quite few companies, people, uh, there's some few fundraising events going at the moment. Um, and if anybody could able to support, help, 
uh, whether they can sponsor uh, or, or just donate uh, or some ways, uh, I would really, really appreciate that. And I think together we can, um, you know, change the perception, make uh, the, you know, uh, world slightly a better place, um, I think. And if you're watching Find Your Finish Line on the video <coughs> podcast, we have the link on the screen there. But just go to crowdfunder.co.uk and you'll be able to find Hari Everest and uh, donate to that. Hari, what, what, what do you, uh, do you have any heroes in your life, mentors, people that you look up to? I think not, uh, not really. I have got many, uh, many people that who I get inspired. Like say, if uh, you know Hillary and Tenzin did they have a summit, maybe we're still waiting someone to summit. Yeah. Uh, and I wouldn't even dream of uh, climbing uh, at Everest. Um, but I think mainly, main thing is I think when we become positive uh, and just do the things that we love, it just opens the door. Uh, and it's not just, we, you know, uh, we create opportunity for ourselves, but we create opportunity for so many uh, people, um, you, you know, around us. Um, just, just giving an example, now I'm talking virtually <laughs> to you. Uh, and I think even for this, someone has you know, challenge themselves, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, invested their time, money, um, and worked, you know, day in, day out to make this happen, uh, right? And we are privileged to use this system. I think any system, I think, any things that um, a human would design our life to make it better, I think at some point they have, you know, challenged themselves and uh, you know, we are privileged to have. If the right brothers, uh, they didn't dream of, you know, flying themselves, then, you know, we wouldn't go to another planet right now. So uh, hopefully uh, challenging myself um, would uh, maybe, uh, you know, create an opportunity uh, to, uh, I hope, which will, I hope will help our future MPTs possibly in a, and of our future generations um, to look up something and uh, learn from something. Mm -hmm. But I think simply, I think I'm here is because just simply just challenging day to day myself. Initially, when I get injured, my, my dream was to, um, you know, just climb on my wheelchair. I couldn't able to climb on my wheelchair because I didn't have enough, you know, muscles built on my arms because I, I used to walk uh, with my legs. <laughs> so I couldn't go to the toilet myself. Uh, I couldn't drive car myself. Even I couldn't able to transfer into the car myself, you know. So when we just do one by one, that is, I think, um, you know, it just becomes bigger and bigger and just get another and another. You know, who dream? I never dreamed of even, <laughs> you know, um, riding a bicycle because I had never seen it uh, in my life. Um, one point, my my dream was to put a flip uh, flops in my um, feet because I, you know, I went to school barefoot. Uh, I played the football. We made the football um, uh, of the sock, putting the plastics and clothes, the, the wall clothes inside and sew it up. And, um, you know, we played in the street. Uh, and I remember, um, you know, my my, toe, my right toenail was, I'm right footed, so my right toenail was just, I, I just hit on the, the rock and I just came off and it's so painful. Um, I remember that. And I think simply, I think I'm here because I think just, you know, challenging one by one by one by one. I think, I think, uh, and I think, I think, uh, there's no limit, I think, uh, and I don't know where, I, where I'll end up tomorrow. I really don't know, but uh, I'm very open-minded and, uh, yeah, take the one challenge at a time um, and move forward in my life. Well, Hari, that is a incredible philosophy because you've taken all these small, small little steps 
and you know where those small little steps are going to get you this spring. We can't wait to follow. How can we follow you? How can we follow your journey? It's Hari Buramangar uh, on my social. So, so I have got a real name. I don't have <laughs> something on an any branding name. So it's a Hari Buramangar on uh, anything, anything. So Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, uh, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, uh, yeah. What's the What's the date that you start? What's the date? So I'm leaving Kathmandu uh, on seventh of April. Okay, 7th of April. And hopefully by the April bond, I will, uh, I will climatize. Uh, and some point in May, um, I will be heading up at the mountain uh, uh, for the summit. Well, I am going to be watching every step of Hari's climb up Mount Everest, as I'm sure the world's going to be. And you know what, Hari, the... Uh, the thing that I'm getting the most out of this is how you're you're humble in your ways, but you're changing the perception all over the world that people with disabilities can do anything they want. Anything they want. Good for you. What are your? It's. Uh, I think for me, it's simply. It's life is all about adaptation. Um, I think this is what I found out. It's very simple. But it's very, very powerful. So, so, um, uh, so we couldn't be together. Uh, so we're talking in the y- 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 virtually now. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we if we are cold, we'll put the warm jacket on. Uh, you know, this is so. Uh, I'm wearing my prosthetic leg right now. I've got my wheelchair just down <laughs> down here. <laughs> uh, so, so, so simply. Um, after my injuries, when I, do, when I was doing sports and adventure, you know, I just found out that, you know, as long as we can able to adapt uh, according to the time and situation, we can able to do anything. So simply, I think the life is all about adaptation and nothing is impossible. Um, um, you know, I, I skied uh, my boat leg. I can ski um, uh, on one ski, sitting on a mono ski, but I can go as fast as um, I did. Uh, I can go the same, any routes that I uh, I went, and I can have exactly the same fun. Uh, so it's just, I think it's just, we just need to do different ways. And also uh, this applies to the business. So with it, this Corona time, I think, um, you know, we did differently. We shopped online. <laughs> we use a sanitizer and so many things. Yeah. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, as long as we can able to uh, adopt our life according to the time and situation, we would able to do that. You know, we made uh, so many things, impossible things possible. Uh, you know, we couldn't able to run um, uh, uh, enough to explore around the world so we start designing the things we, we build the roads and the cars and cycles um and 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 for the water as well so we bought and ship so we build uh, we build the aeroplanes now we can fly to the uh, another planet we don't know what's next <laughs> but 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 i think this is all came from the challenging ourselves i think uh, and uh, as long as we can adapt our life according to the time and situation we will make many, many things possible. Well, I think millions are going to be inspired by your efforts. They have been already. And then you getting to the top of Mount Everest uh, this coming spring. Hari, thank you very much for your time. The best of luck to you. We all can't wait to follow you and your journey. Uh, If you get to the U.S., I I think you may be doing some pre-dinners or post-dinners in New York. I want to get there and meet you. So, uh, hopefully we can get that arranged. So the best of luck to you and take care of yourself, young man. Uh, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, thanks for having me on your podcast. And uh, it's uh, my honor. And uh, yeah, all all the friends, I have got many friends in the U.S., especially mainly veterans. Um, uh, some of uh, some of, uh, some of guys who are injured uh, in combat, uh, but, but, but many friends that uh, some of them I served, uh, them with. So my very best wishes and warm regards to everyone uh, in the United States and around the world.
You got it, Hari. Well, thank you again for joining and namaste us. Namaste to everyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> for joining us on uh, Find Your Finish Line. Hari, a true inspiration. Thank you again. And if you like this, you know, you can give us a review. That would be fantastic. And always remember, everybody, you're the cause of your own experiences. If you keep those experiences strong and positive, you'll always find your finish line, just like Hari's going to find his finish line at the top of Mount Everest. Take care, everybody. Aloha. <laughs>